Coming up this week on the Course of Life podcast, our front nine through the world of golf takes us to a breakthrough at the John Deere and an amazing streak for a house. That's right, a house. Plus a huge captaincy announcement overseas golf and a big announcement about me moving this summer. That's right. Stay tuned for that. Plus, this week's guest is Agent Sebastian from the famous Cart Narcs account. If you follow Cart Narcs on YouTube or social media, you know who he is. He's the viral and controversial account highlighting one of everyone's biggest pet peeves. We get into everything he does and more. Plus, the Celtics are for sale and Red Sox Yankees talk. And when we always end with food, we're talking gooseberries and the hot dog eating contest wrap up. All of it brought to you by Desert Fox Golf. Visit DesertFoxGolf.com and use our promo code Course of Life. It's that easy if you want to save money on great golf gifts any time of the year. That promo code again is Course of Life for anything at DesertFoxGolf.com. We show off their phone caddies, their DJ10 speaker, their swing aid tumblers, and a whole lot more regularly through our content on social media. And we're telling you now that they're our friends and primary sponsors of the program. We appreciate their support greatly. So go ahead and give them support by checking out DesertFoxGolf.com using promo code Course of Life and shopping Desert Fox Golf today. <laughs> and welcome to Course of Life. We are proud to be presented by our friends at Desert Fox Golf. I'm Michael, he's Alex. And let's get right into it, Alex, at the John Deere Classic at TBC Deer Run in Silvis, Illinois. Love that spot. And Quad Cities, Midwest, beautiful little destination there. Yeah. And, you know, we had a we, we had a Georgia alum take the win for their first PGA Tour title, Davis yep. Thompson. Uh, uh, winning by four strokes, pretty easily, pretty easily, twenty eight under par. This is this is that tournament where everyone goes like tries to get to thirty and, and lower. And uh, you know, he really I don't know if he won because he he played really well and he's 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 a good golfer. We're going to see more out of him, or because he stayed at the same Airbnb that the last three runners have stayed winners have have stayed at. What is going on? Yeah, so for to refresh people who don't know this story, basically, lots of PJ Tour players like to stay in groups at Airbnbs, albeit, you know, four bedroom place, six bedroom pace. They all split it and whatnot. They go tournament to tournament. It's kind of a nice group housing, private housing situation for them. Davis Thompson playing and staying with his Georgia buddies, staying in the same Airbnb that last year's champion, Seb Straka, and the champion before also stayed at. And lo and behold, Davis Thompson, Mike, literally stayed in the same room as Sepp Straka did last year mm-hmm. and won the John Deere Classic, keeping the streak alive. That is truly a magical Airbnb. Yeah, it's just crazy. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it sounds like Davis Thompson intends to keep that room next year. But Sepp Straka said, said the same thing last year, Mike, but then he had a baby. That's why his plans changed and he moved out of the magical Airbnb. So we'll see what happens in Davis Thompson's life with him and his wife right now. You know, Maybe a baby interrupts their plans as well and he's moving out and there's an opportunity for someone to stay in the magical room. But regardless, if I'm that Airbnb host, Mike, we got to at least double or triple the price for next year's tournament, right? I mean, you've got to. You've, <laughs> you've got to. I also hope this Airbnb host starts offering some sort of package with TPC Deer Run so you can go and stay a weekend there and be told, hey, you're going to play great at Deer Run because that's what happens when you stay here. Get wow. Some more money, right. money I'm going to hit up end. TPC Deer yeah. Run the moment we get off this recording and send them that <laughs> idea right now. That is gold. Gold, Jerry. Gold. I love it. Gold. Gold. So that was the uh, the John Deere Classic, yep. the PGA Tour. Uh, the the headlining event this next week is the ISCO Championship in Kentucky. Oh I know yeah, we're all you're, you're super big on the, t- the second this. tier events. You love those. Look, Michael Thorbenson is going to be playing back in the field. PGA Tour is University reigning number one from Wellesley, Massachusetts. Mike, there you go. Uh, Joel Damon, Kevin Kisner, Daniel Berger, JJ Spawn, Ryan Brem, Camille Vijegas, CT Pan, all playing in the field. Names there. Uh, if you're wondering where everyone else uh, is going to be playing, they're going to be across the pond at this little tournament, the Genesis Scottish Open. I don't know if you've heard of it, Alex. Um, That's where the past winner, are playing. The uh, past winner there from last year is Rory McIlroy. Some some guy. 
in dramatic uh, fashion. He hit that unbelievable yeah. two iron into the wind, which I think is maybe one of the best shots of 2023 overall to beat Bob mm-hmm. McIntyre down the stretch there. That was a very memorable win. And just me recalling that off the top of my head shows you how significant that was. And he had all the momentum going in the world into the Open Championship, which is what this is. This is that springboard event for guys to get their feet wet, get overseas, get get their sea legs under them, get a week of golf over there. It's not quite the exact same style as true Lynx golf is maybe that you'll see in the Open Championship, but it's a good warmer upper for the uh, the world's best. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll be curious to see who lifts the trophy this week. It, it's a little bit of that week before major lifting the trophy drinks going on, though, I feel like. Yeah, and surprisingly, Scotty Scheffler, I, I feel like surprisingly, Scotty Scheffler not in the field for this. Mm, Should we be surprised? New dad schedule, not just chilling as a dad maybe. now. Yeah, maybe. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Okay. We'll see All right, happens. Scottish Open. Yeah, I, I love this because, again, it's the precursor to the Open Championship, and we get that lovely morning, midday golf. You get all the golf done by like 2, 3 o'clock, and you can actually have the afternoon to yourself, golf fans. So fun week ahead. The uh, Ryder Cup in 2025 is going to be at Beth Page Black in, in New York. That's going to be awesome. It's going to be a great event as always. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the the big announcement that came out today on Monday about this was the captain of Team USA, someone who was snubbed in the last Ryder Cup last year. Mm, yes. And someone who you have uh, played against in high school golf. That is true. Where the random fact of our podcast is I played yeah. high school golf against Keegan Bradley, yeah. who is now the 2025 Ryder Cup captain for Team USA. We were kind of all wondering what the Tiger Woods, Seth Waugh, PGA of America conversations were looking like. He addressed those when I was there at Valhalla a month or two ago, and that had been the rumor for a bit. And now all of a sudden, seemingly a little bit out of nowhere, I, I love the pick and I'm here for the pick. But Keegan Bradley thwarted into the captaincy position for 2025. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm here for it, and I love his Ryder Cup energy. Yeah, I mean, he. I, I think after Zach Johnson's kind of blase energy, vanilla ice cream, and yeah. offishness to me, uh, Keegan is maybe exactly what Team USA needs to get back on the wagon. Here, he's electric. He's always looking for for you know that next spark to get going and he's young he's 39 he'll be 39 at next year's Ryder Cup the youngest captain since Arnold Palmer can you name the year was a playing captain oh playing captain Arnold Palmer I'm gonna go with yeah. 1968 close 63 he oh. was 34 not bad at the time and you know I gotta feel like if Keegan Bradley keeps playing well, do you, do you think he'll tab himself as a as a player and be a player captain? Right, I know. Well, <laughs> here's another fun prediction I'll make early, and no one said this yet, so we'll have this on record for a year oh, and a man. half from now. But Keegan Bradley, good friends and golfing buddies down in Florida, Mike, with, with a, a little guy named Michael Jordan. Heard of him? Heard of him? Michael mm. Jordan, big PGA of America, big Ryder Cup guy. Don't be surprised if Michael Jordan is named in some way to the staff of Team USA alongside oh, wow. Keegan Bradley. That definitely is happening. You know, this is a big departure uh, from from what the PGA has done. You know, we thought, wouldn't you think that maybe Tiger Woods was going to be leading this team? He was it the seemed, President's, yeah. you know, President's Cup playing captain uh, in 2019, victory. And he said no to the 2025 role, according yeah, to Telegraph Yeah, it sounds like he Sports. officially so, just straight up turned it down, which I'm a little surprised yeah. at. But. Yeah, so, and, you know, not going with Zach Johnson again, which I don't blame, you know, Jim Furyk, Davis Love third. You, you got a lot of assistant captains and past Ryder Cups who could have taken this role. So I, I think this is really exciting, exactly what Team USA needs. So Going young and bold. Great. I love the pick, and I look forward to seeing Captain Keegan in the, in the uh, year and a half to come. We have excitement this weekend as well on the LPGA Tour. It is the Amundi Evian Championship, major number 13 of 5,000 that they have during the year. Um, and just a beauty of a golf yeah, course, Mike, out is, in the mountains always. of France. This this is like A-plus golf viewing if you just want the scenery of it all. In the Alps in France, Evian Les Bains. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> Evian um, Les Bains is, is maybe Evian my that's I'm, my few years of French, French. Pr- in high school and college kicking in right there. But yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. setting. 
one of the five majors, Celine Boutier, mm-hmm. getting it done last year. She won the Scottish Open. She got in a little bit of heater last summer. And uh, I'd be very curious to see who lifts the trophy this week. But always fun to do it at a venue like this. It's going to get some great TV coverage this week as well, too. So, again, the scenery at Evian Les Bains is going to be pretty awesome mm-hmm. for the, the Evian. And it's also the 30th anniversary of the Evian Championship. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Love that. So, we'll see if Nellie Korda can recover from her uh, dog bite. And uh, take the win. I know. We're very vague on that. So we're probably yeah. going to be, wait, we're going to get the answer maybe in the Tuesday or Wednesday presser for what actually went down there. But I'm curious to see what the severity is of the injury. All right. Uh, I'm going to clear the floor for a second here, Alex. Cause I, 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 all I know is that you have some sort of announcement you want to say. I don't know uh, what exactly it's about, but I'm going to sit back and get myself a bowl of popcorn and, and prepare myself. Yeah, no, it's uh, a a gigantic tease on my end. You know, I'm a broadcast journalism major myself, uh, born in the world of glorifying uh, sensationalistic media. Uh, So, of course, the announcement's been labeled on the podcast that I'm moving and I am. I am moving, Mike. I am moving. I'm officially announcing it here. I'm constantly moving as well. I just want to. Yep. I I, we're, we're all moving. I'm I'm picking up, moving my things along with my wife and my dog, and we are driving straight through the heartland of America, Mike, all the way up to the Illinois Wisconsin border. It's where my wife's family and the in laws are, and we are staying there. A little extended stay. We're not moving permanently. Mm. Going for probably about three or four weeks of just stress-free, work-free life for me, just chilling on a lake, working on the tan, working on the golf game, and, and heading north for some for some cooler summer weather. I think we would call this clickbait. Yep, that's right. You, yeah. you nailed it, yeah. I, yeah. I haven't even really heard that term in a while, but I'm bringing it back mm. here in 2024. Um, so yeah, extended summer vacation, full drive too, Mike. 16-hour drive coming next yep. week. Uh, so nine hours to Missouri, seven more up to where mm-hmm. we're staying, right on the Illinois Wisconsin border. Uh, you can't I'll be there the whole for lots drive of fun. And you can't do the whole drive in one day. I don't think so. We're we're, we're separating. <laughs> yeah, bringing the dog, taking it easy. We're not going to go too nuts. Nine hours one day, seven or eight the next. That that's more yeah. than enough for us. Yeah, so. that's true. we're that's going to do that. But then, like I mentioned, you'd seen in our conversations as well too. We're going to be doing a really fun partnership revolving around golf and awesome nineteenth hole activities in. Beloit, Wisconsin, the area where I'm staying. Thanks to our friends at Visit Beloit. We're going to be checking out awesome landmarks there. Uh, I'm going to be going to lots of cool restaurants, and breweries in the town area, and playing some of the coolest golf courses in the area as well, too. So excited to get up there and see what the summer golf is like in a little bit of a, t- a different climate than I'm used to. So Beloit, place that I'll be honest, I, I've never heard of. I never heard of Beloit. Uh what what one thing do you do you think I would enjoy most in Beloit from what you've done in your research? Well, I'm I'm roping it into my my little my little tour that I'm doing, Mike. So I'm I'm going to mm. be hitting up the the Riverside area. I think you'd love the farmers market on Saturday morning, second always, largest always farmers, like farmers market, market in the state of Wisconsin. How's that? Okay, wow, pretty cool. Okay. Uh, yep. But more most importantly, I know you're a big minor league baseball guy. We talked about yeah. it last week, and they are home to the Beloit Sky Carp. Great, great minor name. league baseball nickname as they well better, too. I, their their mascot, if their their mascot is probably either incredibly cute looking or <laughs> horribly horrific nightmarish. Looking. It's a g- wonderful combination <laughs> of both. And the Sky Carp are an affiliate of the Miami Marlins. They play right on the river, quite literally on the border. Mike, there's Beloit, Wisconsin, and there is South Beloit, Illinois. So the mm, the Beloit area okay. interacts with two states. So I'll be attending a Sky Carp game, checking out the Sky Carp facility. Nice. Meeting maybe team members, interviewing staff members as well too. I do a little ballpark tour. So I'm also working in a trip to Wrigley Field for the Cubs and nice. a Milwaukee Brewers trip uh, to see mm, the Brew, Brew Crew up in Milwaukee as well too. So I got, yeah. got a little little ballpark tour coming in the next few weeks as, and on our socials as well. I like it. Yeah. I like it. It's gonna be fun. Uh, so we'll have videos headed up there. I'm sure there'll be a clickbaity title like oh, "I yeah. moved to Beloit." Uh, you won't or believe something like what that. I saw on the road. <laughs> All those sorts of things. Um, There's videos up there right now you can check out from Alex's time at Horseshoe Bay, just out of Austin. Um, There's time when you were at uh, Live Houston as well. That one just went up there as well. So you can 
see from the comfort of your own home uh, whether golf is actually louder or not on live. Yeah, and amazing comments in the shorts if you want to if you want to really and get get a real cackle oh. as well too. The internet trolls were out and they and they love my live golf content. I can tell. Yeah, there was there was that one that was like, nah, I think I'll stick with my PGA tour. I don't like these guys anymore. Uh, and uh, I lost a family member in the South Tower, and I, I, I that was horrible, obviously. And and we've talked about on this podcast the taking money from the Saudis and what they've they did to to fund nine eleven. But I just don't feel like that's the venue for that kind of comment. <laughs> As we're and, watching Bryson and, DeChambeau just hit a seven iron yeah, from the and, rough. And other people voice their agreement with that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for some of the other internet for bouncing back yeah. and supporting <laughs> us there. But yeah, check out the the funny comments on our YouTube. I, I don't know. I'm Mike, something about that YouTube audience just brings out the the most unique and candid comments. That's for sure. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, let's do a little tuned in what we're checking out out there uh, outside of the world of yep. golf. Uh, my my wife found on uh, Max a HGTV show, I think fairly new. It's only got one season right now uh, called Who's Afraid of a Cheap Old House? And in this show, uh, a, a restoration, a group of historical restoration experts and, and stuff help a couple buy a old house let just is a dilapidated very, property or what yeah let is very cheap yeah uh in upstate new york and these homes were talking like under a hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow okay yep uh and then they're putting maybe anywhere from 50 to a hundred thousand dollars of work into them and bringing them back to their their heyday and keeping them period specific in the way they decorate and the way they restore them um and it's just really cool to see it done in a way that's not making all the homes very generic looking like a lot of rehab shows are these days so it's a lot worth of it the get... renovation's worth it in the end yes there was one uh that we just watched where they bought a house for thirty four thousand dollars. i love that price and then put an additional sixty six thousand in work in they only had a hundred thousand dollar budget first of all i want to know where they're finding these freaking homes <laughs> Yeah, because I, I can't buy a dilapidated old house in savannah for under three hundred thousand dollars I know, I like, we should start investing in property <laughs> wherever these houses are yeah. got in some deals um, so really cool to see some of the things they do that you know that their attention to being specific to the time period and trying to make them look really awesome to what they used to look like and doing it within a budget and not try you know this isn't all the bells and whistles this is that they only have maybe fifty thousand to do a lot of work on it so they're going to do things that maybe are a little more cost conscious for the owners. And, and there's no like, oh my God, we don't have the money. We need to spend more. There's no big surprises like you have in some of these shows. Right. So it's really, it's a nice kind of escape. It's a nice little breath of fresh air in the way a lot of, a lot of shows on HGTV are sometimes these days. Very cool. Who's afraid of a cheap old house? Good wreck there for the HGTV crowd out there. Uh, I'll go with my tuned in and follow up on what I discussed earlier uh, in last week's episode. I uh, yeah. got through the first half of the Bear Season 3, and I've officially finished Season 3. Uh, mm -hmm. The overall recap, Mike, you know, the bear still a great show. Uh, love the interplay between the characters. They, they just got very, very artsy kind of with the plot points in each episode in season three. And there was very little plot movement at all. Uh, there were not many questions answered. Iowa Debris got an amazing offer to move to a different restaurant. We don't know what she did with that. There's a lot of unresolved things that really didn't get a lot of resolution at all as the season ended. So my season bear, re my season three bear recap is basically the the show continues on. It it still is what it is, and I enjoy it. But you didn't get a lot of answers this season. All right. So thanks for spoiling season three for me. Not that I've even finished season one. Yep, um, that's right. Yep, I, I, the spoilers yep. uh, there for everyone. So, uh, but no, nah, I, I, there's a lot within the plot and what does develop uh, between uh, Carmi's relationships uh, is definitely unfolding nicely in season three. Definitely worth the watch if you've been a diehard for the first two seasons. But I'm curious out there to see if you think this season three kind of hit a little bit differently and just not quite the same way for you. And if anybody's wondering, I'm at least not watching uh, House of the Dragon. Alex, I'm assuming you're not either. Nope. So don't ask us about anything to do with that show. Just don't. <laughs> Limited knowledge right. on Tuned In. Only what we watch. Look, I actually know a lot about um, 
uh, Game of Thrones from from everyone else who would talk about it, but I only ever watched season one. So, mm. all right, let's uh, get to this week's guest, someone who's been featured on Dr. Phil. It's someone I didn't think I'd actually talk about on this podcast, I'll be honest, Alex. Um, he's got a he's got a huge f- uh, account on social where he calls out people for their lack of common decency. Mm. And I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, th- it's the age old debate, not really debate, the the common decency issue of when you finish grocery shopping and you're in the parking lot. The grocery cart that you moved all of your groceries back to your car, Mike, where does it go? It goes in the cart corral. It does. And there are cart corrals pretty much all over every normal grocery store you'll visit around the world. But there's a lot of people who are offenders and they are, quote unquote, lazy bones, to quote our next guest. So Agent Sebastian is out there to find all the lazy bones. I present to you a great conversation with Mr. Cartonark himself, Agent Sebastian. Next up, he's the leader of a movement for public decency and against being a lazy bones. It's the Kartnark King, the agent of the Kartnarks himself, Sebastian, joining us on the Course of Life. Sebastian, how are you doing today? Very good. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. And that's a pretty good summary. I like it. Yeah, I tried with the intro. Um, I want to give a little context to our audience. We love having all sorts of different personalities from the sports landscape, the media landscape. Every once in a while, I find something that's on social media that I just have to showcase that fascinates me. Um, so give a little bit of background first. They can see you're in uniform, you're in your HQ, uh, but where are you currently reside and what's your day job look like in addition to Carton Arcs? Sure, yeah. The, our current our Carton Arcs headquarters is in the greater Los Angeles area. Although, as you'll see from our videos, we literally are a global presence. Um, and yeah, day to day, it's, it's uh, pretty simple. I, we, I work for actually for a local radio show here, which is uh, syndicated to a few a couple markets around the country and in Canada and some other places. Um, <clears throat> and then Cardinarch's patrols typically happen in the afternoons. You'll notice we don't do anything after dark because we don't want to spook or scare anybody. Yep. Uh, you know, we don't do anything in the snow or the, the rain or the, the blistering heat because we want uh, carton arcs encounters where we ask folks to return their shopping cart to be as excuse free as possible meaning that oh it's rainy oh it's snowing oh it's I, oh i'm scared oh, i thought you were gonna rob me you know <laughs> uh in cart we want to because people will and now despite that of course when you watch carton arcs videos there are a thousand excuses um but i try when i do these to remove as many as possible just from the very beginning. Good context for sure. Yeah. So like you said, you work for a radio show, The Woody Show, and I'm sure this idea may have come when there were ideas being thrown around in the office. You know, you love talking on the radio show about pet peeves, things that are are commonalities with all of your audience. Um, But tell me a little bit about the moment that sparked the idea for Carton Arcs. And it really was just that. It wasn't, uh, and I joke about, you know, there being some sort of Batman or Spider-Man style origin story. Um, but yeah, I was just talking about uh, carts and why don't people, you know, and, and it's, and I can't claim the original observation. It's, it's millions of people around the world have had it. Yeah. The earliest a fun fact observation that I know of was, I think it was 1991. There was a, uh, an edition of the Peanuts cartoon. Yes. Charlie Brown and the Peanuts gang. <laughs> Where it was Snoopy and uh, Woodstock, the little the little bird, and Woodstock in in the cartoons is kind of a jerk, and he has his little mini shopping cart, and he just leaves it against a tree, and Snoopy's like, "Oh, one of those people," and that was you know thirty five years ago or whatever. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's 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 but you could you could search you know social media from you know as as, far, as early as those records go back back to the early two thousands, kids. <laughs> And people Very have cool. had this observation since then, and I just was the first one who made it a sort of systematic examination and then sort of exploration and attempted enforcement, uh, although it's not the, the force and enforcement is very light. Right. Uh, and I've kind of made that a a niche project, which the and internet's rather allowed playful me. as well, too. People should right. know. Yeah, it's it's not hardcore and harsh. Uh, it's it, but thanks to the internet, you couldn't really do that. You know, like you mentioned, it's part of a radio segment or a news. I, I, th- I like to think of it as um, 
like your local TV news has a lot of them will have a guy who does like consumer reports. Yep. The investigative journalist who is out there stomping feet feet, boots on the ground, trying to find out the local issues and see what's what. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very low level. It's not, you know, it's not Watergate. It's not, (laughs) you know, WikiLeaks. It's, hey, why is this, uh, why is this local mechanic ripping off his customers? Yep. Why don't people return cards? And uh, that was it. That was, that was basically all it was. And then thanks to the internet, you can kind of make one little thing, its own thing. And that's what Cardnarks is. Very cool. Well stated, stated. So that's the mission is to change that behavior and get rid of those lazy bones mentalities, which we'll get into. But now I know you worked in a grocery store in your younger days. So I'm curious, was that where the idea spawned? Or do you have memories being the cart wrangler and seeing these people when you, when you worked there back in the day? Yeah, I, I was, I did work in a couple of different, two different grocery stores when I was in high school and a uh, part, and you know, when you're that, that job is bagging groceries, stocking shelves, getting carts, essentially when you're a teenager. Um, and I don't recall there being as big of a problem as there is today. And mm. uh, I don't have that. No one has ever done a, uh, it's hard to do now because we don't have time machines, but I don't recall them being just scattered to the wind. Like I don't recall having to go down to, uh, you know, to the sidewalk and bus stops and uh, the local apartment buildings to to wrangle our carts. Um, Now, part of that could be I grew up in Nashville, and it's I tend to find in my travels around the country that the smaller, especially more like southern or midwestern towns, are usually better about it. Big cities, L.A., New York, you know, it's, it's filling the yep. blank. So they don't have the second. They got to go. Right, right. Well, yeah. Well, I think I think part of it is it my again, my armchair psychologist is, you know, your neighbor more. You're, you're there's less anonymity in smaller mm. towns. So I don't recall there being just carts left everywhere. Uh, but again, I worked at smaller grocery stores and work at a big super Walmart, uh, which wasn't really a thing like it is now. So that could be part of it, too. Uh, but yeah, it's. I don't recall that being a problem or an issue. Hmm, Interesting. So uh, for those watching on video right now, you're in full outfit, which definitely gives some context for exactly the content you're creating uh, with the carton arcs here on the show. Um, But describe your outfit and presentation, how you go about filming the content specifically. Well, it's something that has certainly evolved over time. Like I said, when when I first started this, it was literally just me asking people, oh, why'd you leave that out? And then from there, they, uh, many people exploded on me. (laughs) Again, I wasn't threatening them. I wasn't harassing or uh, intimidating in any way. I, oh, why'd you do that? And I got threats back. I got threats of violence. I got every excuse in the book. So I just sort of the thought, I thought like, oh, well, what if I, you know, it's kind of like, well, what if? So what if this person was kind of a, uh, you know, like a, a meter maid or a hall monitor or, or was an eight or like more than that? Like, well, what if they were like G.I. Joe? And what if there was a bunch of them again? Uh, <laughs> You know, like, wouldn't that be silly, again, from the lighthearted aspect of this, that there's a guy who takes carts super, super seriously, uh, you know, and he's like fixated in on it as his life mission. Again, like a Batman or a G.I. Joe or whatever. And so over time, I, you know, I I had a T-shirt that said Cartonarchs and a a vest that said Cartonarchs. Then when someone pulled a gun on me uh, in uh, Georgetown near you, uh, a cop actually from Baton Rouge mailed me one of his like spare or old uh, bulletproof vests wow so so then that well what if i had a little ticket i gave people what if that was a magnet you know that couldn't like a bumper sticker and so and what if i had a and people that would you know not every car is uh has a lot of steel or is has a lot of iron what if there was a flag that had a little suction cup you know it's like well what if that that's been the whole kind of progression of it over the the, the few years i've been doing it very cool. Let's talk about the different scale of the reactions. You hinted at one of the wilder ones there, um, but let's start at the beginning with uh, what we, we, we do see on occasion: your calm and your cool and your obliging reactions. Talk me through what the range of those look like, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they they just kind of feel a little guilt for maybe being caught red-handed and are willing to am- amend their mistake pretty quickly. Yeah, and I, I've really been trying, especially recently, to tag videos at the end with someone who is nice, who says, ah, my bad. Or I had one yesterday where the guy was like, he looked at me, looked at the cart, which, and he was two spots from the cart return and just dumped it behind his car. And he goes, you can see his wheels turning. He's like, ah, okay. Uh, so that's, that's the low end. People who are just nice. 
Well, then there, I would say there's a lower end people who just ignore me. We've I've included a few of those where right. either they don't understand or they just figure I'm getting out of here and they realize that they that I can't stop them. I'm not trying to stop them and they just go on their merry way. So those are kind of like the low end responses. And I, of course, appreciate the people who are nice and apologetic more than anybody because uh, that is the that's like the civil thing to do is if someone points out, oh, hey, especially if they're polite about it, which I am. The civil thing to do is return their politeness with politeness and say, ah, my bad. I was being, I was being a little lazy. No big deal. So then the next level beyond that is yep. the arguers. The folks who they, they don't want to either, they, or they, they admit that they, don't, that they don't want to do it, but that they have a reason or an excuse or an argument for why they shouldn't do it. And that runs the gamut from, and you've heard a thousand of these of where it's, they pay people to pick up the carts. Uh, I'm in a hurry. They always have some major some major emergency just popped in their head, not while they took five minutes to load their groceries, not while they took the 30 right, minutes to yeah. go there shopping. There were several bags they put in the trunk too as well. Right, yeah. but suddenly right then, oh, and, they, they, and <laughs> there's, this just happened yesterday again uh, to me, is people really are scummy about using their kids. And I've heard the daycare slash school slash soccer practice excuse more times than I can count. Because right. they know that's a like a sort of a protected class, easy oh. defense mechanism and wall to throw up right there. Right, right, right. Oh, I'm a, I'm a parent. You can't go after me because I have kids and kids are important. And that's such a dirty move because you <laughs> because because then when someone does, you know, it's the boy who cried wolf. Obviously, um, it's 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 so un- dishonest and it and it's it, it's it, it calls people and you know, puts them on a defensive. Another one I see a lot, which is, uh, I'll admit, a little more uh, dicey of a situation is injury, handicap, slash disability. Because lots of carts end up going in those handicap spots as well. It's a very contentious point uh, there, especially in your videos, I see. Yeah, because there's a lot of space there because because they have extra space for people with walkers, wheelchairs, etc. And and they will and and they, they don't talk about how they walked all around the store. How they walked to re- when they didn't need when they do when they did need the cart they could walk to the cart area they could pick it up they could walk around they could load groceries they could sometimes load very heavy things but the second they don't need that cart and just want to dump it off wherever oh I'm handicapped oh and, and and I get it and people will argue with me they'll say well not all disabilities are visible fully understand that I've had sure. uh, you know spinal injuries I understand completely get that but I call it into question and I don't take that as an excuse when I just saw them do all sorts of manual labor and it's just suddenly like with the kids flares up. So that's yep. kind of the middle area and well the high end, yeah, and the high end area is violence. <laughs> yep. Let's get right to that. And basically, you know, Georgetown, Texas, a neighbor of mine to the North in Austin, nice central Texas suburb, but tell everyone a little bit about what went down with one of your, your more scarier exchanges. Right. And uh, I, I get, I love getting these like, because no one's ever heard of Georgetown, Texas, if they don't live there, of course. Yeah, I'm but, 15, you know, 20 I, minutes away. It's a, just a sleepy little suburb that's on the, right. on the rise and has a beautiful downtown. It's not the type of place you would expect <laughs> that interaction to occur, to be honest. But what I like to do is I like to like, I, in that case, I was driving from Dallas to Austin and I, I like to stop along the way, and I, you know, because it, it gives the little slice of life of middle America, like you said. And so I'm approaching this guy and you can see the whole thing in the video. It's that's what I love. I love about the videos is they're almost never edited at all because it's typically just a, a running commentary thing uh, unless there's like a big break of just nothing happening there's almost no cuts in cart narcs videos um and so i walk up to the guy he'd like dumped his cart and eh, not terrible but it's like in the grass uh right in front of a parking spot which people say oh it's out of the way uh not if you got a truck or a minivan where you need to where you back in and you need to open up your rear hatch and that cart is right in your way anyway walk up to the guy point out the cart and he's like, oh, yeah, why don't you get that for me, buddy? You know, he's trying to blow me off. He, but, to be, but very importantly, he knows I'm only talking about that cart. I'm not trying to carjack him, not trying to hurt him in any way. That it's is written clear. clearly right on your name. Right, right. <laughs> he, he's talking to me about that cart. I'm talking to him about that cart. There is no, there's no uh, doubt about what we're discussing. The second I pull out my little magnet that says I don't return my shopping cart like a jerk, and I'm about to put that on the side of what uh, he claims, I believe, is his work truck, uh, he says, you get that, you get it away. I didn't put it on. He said, you get that away from my truck, buddy. Cause and again, that's not going to hurt his truck. It's just a magnet. 
a clean magnet too, may I say? <laughs> yes. But the second I go to like put it on the on his uh, passenger door, uh, out comes the like the Glock nine. And of course, I'm not going to stand there. Or Agent Cordell, sorry, my Texas agent is. Uh, he's not going to stand there and just look down the barrel of a gun because that's stupid. Uh, <laughs> so it backs away and the guy drives off. Just so happens, within like that minute or so, there's a there's a Georgetown police cruiser there, uh, and flag her down. She calls in her superior, and uh, th- there's there's a cut here because there's like 15 minutes of talking. Yep. Uh, and I'll, I'll fill folks in on what happened there. So superior says, well. Do you have his license plate? And I was like, well, I guess I can go because it's on GoPro, you know, strapped to my chest, so you can't really see it on there. Pull out my laptop, load the video. This is all taking time, of course. Show them the license. They run the plate. They said, well, that is a truck. That is a uh, that is. Because I told him what happened. The guy pulled a gun on me. You know, is that not brandishing? Because because it, it's I, there's lots of times in a lot of Cartnarks videos where they threaten violence. They threaten to run me over. Right. Physically come after me, and that's technically uh assault or potentially aggravated assault uh but and i don't and i'm like whatever okay that's fine but this case where there's firearms that's just that's a man who is a irresponsible gun owner when he's taking that out and racking the slide that gun is pointed out into, into traffic at that point by the way uh so talking to the cop he says well do you i can't i do you even know there's a gun so i gotta pull in freeze frame show him the gun he calls in and he says, and I, I did leave this part in the, at the end, his explanation where he says, well, according to Texas law, that's not exactly brandishing. He needs to point it at you and or fire around. And I've had people dispute that uh, interpretation. Interesting, yeah. And he says to me, uh, he says to me, the, 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 I guess the uh, uh, supervisor who'd come in from Georgetown PD, he says, well, he might say that you uh, threatened him or were trying to steal his truck. And I say to the guy, well, I've got the entire, the entire interaction on video and audio. So it's not your, and I, I was, I don't, I didn't fight with him too hard, but it's not the police officer's job to be that man's defense attorney, you know, <laughs> you know, to the, it, it, so my, my impression was they didn't want to do the paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, that he's, he, that lazy bones is a scot free. Um, and I blurred out his company information. He claimed it's his company. Uh, just cause I don't know, you know, uh, cause I don't, we don't want doxing and, and retaliation. Uh, so that's kind of the long and short of the, I guess. For the, sure. It's all in the name of the carts too. Again, it's yeah. Seb- agent Sebastian with cart narcs joining us. It's at cart narcs all over social YouTube. Be sure to watch the videos right after this interview. Amazing entertainment, like the realest content you can find on social media and all just in the name of a little common decency. That's it, Sebastian. That's, that's all it. we're going for. Uh, let's get into a couple of comebacks that you might get. The most common one that I know that people out there are saying right now is, if I see a little embankment with a tree and some mulch and three other people have already put their cart there, why can't I just do it if a bunch of people are already doing it too, Agent? Well, a couple of reasons there. That's that's the old, uh, you know, everybody jumps off a bridge fallacy. Uh, but like I just mentioned with the guy in Texas, a lot of that's 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 better. There's there's a very there's a gradation of violations when it comes right. to carts and the war and that's that's up there because it's not loose it's not going to roll and crack people's cars or their fenders which i get practically every day i get a photo or a video of a loose cart like oh damn it cart narcs i wish you were here i got a dent in my my door now so that's that's good it's not it's but it's not great because typically those areas are where you would want to let's say you back into a spot you or you want to open a hatchback now you're that cart is in that person's way so it's not it's it's safer, but it's still not safe. It's or still not I should not say I say safe. It's still not convenient for other people. Not to mention it's that's a way for dirt and mud and sticks and blah 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 to get in the wheels. So it's it's just it's lazy. It's it's less lazy, but it's still lazy for that reason and it's still causing an inconvenience for the next person who might pull on that spot. Okay. And then the other gray area I want to address is inclement weather. I know you touched on it a little bit, but we've got, you know, I'll spend a winter in Illinois. It'll be zero degrees with 30 mile an hour wind, or you could have downpours or or all sorts of storm events. And people will often use that as an excuse to be lazy bones. I know there's a little bit of context there, but where where does Agent Sebastian officially stand on that? Well, yeah, I I don't do any, I don't do any patrols in in inclement weather outside of maybe a, a light drizzle. Um, but just for that reason, because I don't want to hear that excuse. That being said, if it's truly, truly that bad and or dangerous, 
how did you get your card out there? You know, and, and for the, and for the next person, let's say you leave, let's say, oh, it's raining. So you leave your cart is, you know, in the spot next to yours. Well, the next person that pulls in there, it's still going to be raining, assumedly. And now they have to worry about opening their door into your cart while it's raining. And they have to move your cart while out of the way while it's raining. So it, it still is the golden rule. It's saying my time is more important than the next person's time who might be here in 15 seconds. And if, and again, if it was really that bad, if it's really thunder, lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes, you wouldn't have even been able to walk to your car. Like what, it, uh, there's a great video actually, you can, and they found this, this woman and it is literal hurricane conditions. And she walks her cart like five spots over to put it back because also in inclement weather, Love guess that. what happens? There's high winds. And so the other cars that are already in that parking spot, they're likely to be damaged and more likely to be damaged by your cart because you said, oh no, I can't get, uh, you know, more wet because you're already wet for 15 seconds. So that, again, it's selfishness, it's laziness, and it, it really fails any kind of scrutiny, that excuse. Well said. Agent Sebastian, again, with cart narcs and the Woody show as well, too. Let's just get into some rapid fire questions, just 30 seconds on each of these. Let's start with, in the United States, the worst state for for, for the cart narc. Uh, who, who's just the worst? You mentioned it's city specifically, but is there one state that sticks out to you? I would say, and maybe it's it, it could be because I'm there a lot, Las Vegas, Nevada is pretty bad. Mm. Uh, and I've been to the other desert cities, you know, Phoenix and Albuquerque and so on, Reno. Um, and I just, it, may, it might be just because of the kind of the, the trash that Las Vegas <laughs> attracts. Uh, it, and it's really grown a lot too in the past yep. 10, 20 years as everybody has left California because of the high cost of living. Nevada and Idaho are taking the, and Texas, quite frankly, I'm sure you're aware of uh Oh, really yeah. California is Texas. almost here. <laughs> yeah. And this, Austin, especially, is essentially a suburb of Los Angeles at this point. Um, and, and so I think really Las Vegas is probably, and there, but not, not Nevada as a whole, but really Las Vegas is probably the worst overall city. Okay. And then outside the U.S., I know you've had some international experience as well. Was there a country outside the U.S. that surprised you with, with, their, with their poor cart etiquette? With their poor, I would say I didn't know what to expect in Spain. And I was, to be fair, I've only patrolled like literally on the island of Ibiza, which is, that's like saying I've only been to, I've been to America, but only- An interesting plot point from Spain though, Ibiza, that's quite a location to, uh, to, to be cart narking. <laughs> and look, I happen, I happen to be there for other reasons, as you might imagine. Uh, but it'd be, like, it'd be like saying, oh, I went to, I visited America and my entire impression is based on, you know, like a party city, like New Orleans or Las Vegas or yeah, whatever. Yeah, seriously. Hawaii or whatever. Um, and, but I, and I didn't, I wasn't in uniform there and I don't speak great Spanish, but I was just walking around and I, I managed to talk to like, there's these four dudes in a Jeep and they just left, they dumped their cart off wherever and the car returns right over there. And I just kind of asked them, por que el carrito es aquí? And one dude, he's like, first off, he's white, he's like licking his fingers, he's eating something, licks his fingers and wipes them on the wall. It's disgusting. Um, and essentially they said, well, there's somebody who's paid to pick it up essentially. And I was kind of like, oh, por qué? He, you know, he's, he's no aquí it's kind of this time. Um, and so it was the same sort of just dumb excuses. Uh, the, best, the best country, and I highlighted this in the video, Japan, of course, orderly. And I went to a Costco in Japan. Big, big lot. Not a single cart left out. It was not even, it doesn't even cross their Wow. Mind, so that's, okay. uh, if we could be more like Japan in a lot of ways, I think we'd be a better place. Good to know. Hey, we love doing a lot of golf content in this show. So I'm going to cross over a little bit because there is a golf cart epidemic with where those get left. I don't know if you yeah, play you the game much, but those are either A, incorrectly parked all over, or there are people that do not know properly where to drive their golf cart on the course. Uh, so there's definitely maybe another account or another brand for you to branch off of. I know you do a lot in the cart space, so I just wanted to throw that your way. <laughs> That's interesting. So like you're talking about driving on the green and stuff like that? Cl or close to it, yep. Or it's funny, what you'll appreciate is some golf courses have now installed some sort of GPS software in the golf court cart to where if you get too far off their desired area, it will start beeping and then it will literally shut down and you need to go in reverse until you get back into the area where you're approved to drive the cart. So they've really taken it to the next level in the golf industry. Well, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. It sounds like kind of like they have, uh, if you ever take, which I don't do it, but I know you guys have in Austin, those little e-scooters, like yep. there's certain areas, like when in San Diego, for instance, around Comic-Con time, 
they don't want a thousand e-scooters around a million people. So there's like they geo fence off areas. So I guess that sounds like a similar process yep. with the golf carts. Definitely. I yeah, like that's that. a big if they thing. Could do that, if they could do that with shopping carts, that'd be very interesting. Well, they, they so sort of I do. might have to start the golf cart narcs account and we can start working together a little bit more, maybe if I find well, that some sounds good interesting. content. I, I, I honestly I have no near plans to do it. So anybody who wants to, it's uh, it's open for <laughs> Love it. Hey, one a common thing that is a spark plug issue on the internet, I feel like it circles around every six to 12 months and you're a good person to ask, where do you stand on reclining your seat on an airplane? That is a good question. Yeah, I'd see that a lot too. Um, and there are, I believe Spirit Airlines doesn't even offer like that function. They don't even, I think that I, I might be wrong about that, but um, my, my uh, point or I guess angle on that would be it's it's a design feature of the seat. So if they didn't want you to do it, uh, they wouldn't have it designed. Now, that being said, there is etiquette around how you do it. You'll see some people, they just slam it back. <laughs> yes. they're, you know, it's like, it's like it, it's, I, to me, it's kind of like a, holding a door open, you know, like you could either, you can either like make sure it's nice or closing a door on an Uber, for instance, you know, you can either close it nice and gently and, or you could slam, wham, who cares? I'm on my way. So um, I get that point. I get why people are frustrated. But at the same time, if it, if it weren't, it's not like people are hacking the seats to make them recline. They're designed to recline. So take it up with the airline. Yeah, the delivery of how you do the recline definitely does say a lot about how, what, what you're like as a person, your level of common decency. So I do yes. appreciate that that test for sure and that take. Uh, we finished with food questions, so these are some really easy ones. Uh, I know you find a lot of random things in these parking lots. What's the most common food items that you find in a grocery store parking lot? I know you've seen purses and random things left behind as well. Yeah, purses, phones, uh, no babies yet, and okay. uh, no animals either, thank goodness. Um, I would say it's typically it's it's something simple like they'll grab uh, like a snack piece of candy or something and they'll they'll you know and they'll throw it on the bottom or it's, or it's underneath a bag. Uh, I found that numerous times. Uh, or there's something like a, a case of water that's on the bottom of the cart. Yep. Okay. And you know what? Because you didn't take time to walk your cart back, you didn't take you didn't give that cart a once over, <laughs> and now you're out your water or whatever. Like you said, I found cell phone, multiple cell phones, multiple purses, multiple wallets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So but yeah, typically it's like water or something on that bottom area of the cart. Okay, cool. And uh, what's your favorite drink that you've had thrown on you? Well, I, there's a famous, where I got two thrown at me at once. One was a McDonald's, like a Diet Coke and McDonald's. The other was like a Bang Energy drink from a, a lady here in uh, north of uh, LA in Santa Clarita, like a suburb of LA. Um, and I've, that's the only, I've had that. I had a guy in San Diego try to throw a jug of water at me, which wasn't even close. Like, I'm gonna throw water at, and he threatened me too. First, he's like, "I'm gonna throw water at you." I was like, "Oh no, oh my gosh!" But, well, I'm the you know wicked witch of the west. Not the still here. water. Not the still water. Oh my god. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, I haven't had a ton of that. People, people most often throw my own magnets back at me because that's it's something yeah. that it's of no value to them, and I'm I, I'm handing it to them almost. Uh, so that's the most common thing. I'm trying to think what's been chucked at me. Yeah, that's mostly been. Oh no, you're right. I, I did uh, like a year ago. I was up at the at a Costco here in Burbank, and a guy threw a Pepsi at me. But it was a Costco Pepsi, so it had the loose top. And, and in the process of squeezing and throwing it, it went all over him and all over his car. That was oh, that was very he ended satisfying. Up being the idiot there. That, that's the most satisfying is when they do was it, when in their idiocy and yep. rage they managed to throw or and no one's ever hurt themselves badly but they managed to uh, make themselves look the fool by being so ridiculous. Yeah, you and I take special joy in behavior like that. I appreciate that. It's Agent Sebastian again with Cart Narcs. We end with our 19th hole question, which I'll rephrase a little bit differently. You just had a hard day working, and then you were out there patrolling in the lots. What's like your go-to meal and drink to unwind at the end of a long day as the Cart Narc agent? It's a good question because I've been to... <laughs> be fun to have like a little... Like I've done this in one video where I had like a fake sponsor where I pulled an RB sandwich out of my... Pocket yes. like, oh, Arby's, the official <laughs> meal of Cartner, which, which is not the official. It was just a joke. Uh, uh, did it, did, that's a good question. I, you know, usually it's people don't realize this, and I, I credit uh, law enforcement for this. Those vests uh, are like they're six pounds dry, and that's without the plates and the, the bulletproof plates. Just the just the uh, the, uh, 
the material is six pounds. Wow. And they get super sweaty. I've always got like a giant sweat stain on the back and the front. So it's like a Gatorade, really. Uh, you know, like one of the like a yellow or a white or a, I like like the the, uh, the citrusy flavors. Gatorade Zero. You know, if you're watching watching your figure, that's all because you really you really it takes it out you to do a little card narking. Yeah, well, we appreciate what you're doing. You put a lot of energy in the content, and I love following the ride. Again, check out at Cartnarks on social media. The full-length videos on YouTube are must-watch. Agent Sebastian, thanks so much for hopping on the course of life and look forward to seeing more great content. No, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Course of Life podcast is brought to you by Zencaster. We've been using Zencaster here since almost the very beginning as how Alex and I record this podcast from hundreds of miles away. And it provides us with great quality audio that works every time. And it's something that makes Course of Life what it is and has kept us being able to make consistent episodes every week. And now it's super easy to record a podcast with Zencaster. You log in using your browser and start recording a high quality podcast right away. You record studio quality sound and up to 4K video with your guests. You feel a sense of Zen knowing Zencaster's multi layered backups ensure you always have your recordings in the highest quality, even if the connection is unstable. And have you ever wondered what you actually sound like? Zencaster's post-production process makes you sound buttery smooth. It automatically removes those ums and ahs in your recording. It removes those awkward pauses in conversation too. Set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing background noise with the click of a button. Head on over to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use our promo code course of life to get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. We want you to have the same easy experiences we do for all of your podcasting and content needs. Again, that's Zencaster.com slash pricing and our promo code course of life. Zencaster, it's time to share your story. Great chat there with Agent Sebastian. I love that someone out there has the balls yes. <laughs> to do this for the rest of us because I will, in my car, uh, curse you out. You just for being quietly scold through, through your car window. I Got will it. hold my hand down low so you don't see it and flick you off. Yep. Uh, and as we drive away, I will get increasingly more angry at you. Um, but I will not confront you because I don't I don't want to get punched. I don't want to get shoved. I don't want I don't I don't need you calling me names for me being in the right because I'm in the right. So I'm glad Agent Sebastian is there to do it for us. He's the hero we don't deserve. It's an unbelievable <laughs> thing that he does risking his life quite literally, Mike. That's where he's why he's wearing a bulletproof Has vest. He, okay, he had a gun pulled on him here in Georgetown, Texas. Oh, so they, these people don't play around when they get angry. Has he? Has he? I don't. I don't, I don't think I've seen one uh, I, from from him. Maybe I missed it. Has he done an Aldi where they give you you have to pay to get a cart so you get your money back if you return it? I haven't seen much Aldi content from him to be honest. No, I really haven't. I feel like Aldi shoppers are respectful, good people. Yeah, if there are, if they're already going in knowing that those are the rules around the carts then you have to think that they've got enough of a brain to understand where it goes. Yeah. You would think um, so. I mean, you, you go to Aldi to save money, but then you need to have the money also to get that cart and you'll get your money back. But still, you know. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm, and again, uh, Lord's work that Agent Sebastian's doing out there. Yeah. <laughs> I commend his bravery every day. Check out Cart Narc, C-A-R-T-N-A-R-C-S, all over social and YouTube. We thank him again for joining the show. We'll be sure to share some of his videos in the weeks and months to come as well too. If you like that or any other conversation you heard so far, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you're listening. It does an immense amount for us and gets this podcast and this content out to way, way more people, which is what our goal is here on The Course of Life. So again, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe right now and uh, let, let's keep it rolling and, and head on into the back nine. Let's talk about basketball because the Boston Celtics, the world champion Boston Celtics, are for sale. Yeah, right <laughs> after winning the championship for the first you know, time in 16 years. This is how you cash in. 
It is. And, and we're learning a little bit about exactly what happened. We were originally very confused. We thought it was kind of Wick Grossbeck's decision and everyone was very surprised by that. But in reality, it's actually his father, 90-year-old Irv Grossbeck, kind of getting his affairs in line as a 90-year-old man maybe should and would. And just listen, it, they invested and bought the team for a little under $400 million, and now they're probably going to sell it for $5 billion. I, I think that was a pretty good investment on their part. And I, it's actually a very savvy business move, despite the fact that Celtics fans may not like the idea that we're, we're now shopping for, for new ownership. Well, you know, I'm sure that they were unhappy that he had to walk however far he had to walk with the trophy and the banner to, for the parade. That, that was, was just a hustle too much. That was... That was that was that was the line for him, I think. <laughs> Indeed. So, I mean, yeah, who's who's buying the uh, the the Celtics, Mike? Well, is it Bob Kraft? Is it Tom Brady? Ooh. I love just naming Patriots because that's what I do. Is it? Uh, is it? Uh, wow, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, but he helped win. He helped the Celtics win uh, in the last dynasty. Um, Kevin Garnett. No, the other one. Larry Bird. Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce. No, he doesn't have the money like that, Mike. No. <laughs> well, he can get a group together. He he, look, I would be happy to buy the Celtics if someone else up there confront the $4.999 billion. <laughs> Just whatever whatever happens, please don't let John Henry, the crooked owner oh, of the God. Red Sox and a million other franchises, take over the Celtics. That's the one thing I don't want to happen. Who knows? You never know. Yeah. They might. You never know. Uh, speaking of John Henry and the Red Sox. I'm going to I'm going to once again for the second time this podcast, Alex, I'm going to clear the floor. Second floor you, clear. Wow. And let you go off on how much better uh, you guys are than my horrifically bad slumping Yankees. The Red Sox do own the Yankees right now at this moment. This is basically our halfway poll. We're heading into All Star Week next week um, in time for next week's show. But yeah, the basic narrative is we were a million games behind. The Yankees looked on top of the world. You're coming back to reality. We're getting hot. If, Lord willing, they could make one or two moves of the deadline, I don't really think it's going to happen, but if they could do it, it could really put the Red Sox over the top. They're very much in the thick of the wild card contention. Just a few games back and surging. What We could catch you by the time I come back from Illinois and get back to Texas sometime in August. That'll, that'll be my prediction. I may have to stay in Illinois a few days longer for that to actually happen, but uh, we're coming for you, and it's only a matter of time. Yeah, the the one bright spot from from all this right now is that the Yankees called up Ben Rice, who went ahead and hit three homers against the Red Sox on uh, that was that insane. Saturday, uh, snapping the four game slide that we had going. So that's the one bright spot. The rest of the team, uh, including Aaron Judge, still maybe an, you know a uh, MVP candidate. Just, Horrible. The team's just horrible, right? Yeah, I'm surprised how well the top starters held off the Yankees lineup for the for the better part of the weekend, winning two out of three. Uh, so, yeah, a good sign at the halfway pole. You and I know there's a million miles to go, and August and September yep. seem to drag a forever lot can change. as these standings get can jiggled around. So we'll, we'll be um, all over. Yeah, it's crazy how much can change in the second half of the season. So yep. we'll, we'll definitely see what's going on. Uh, but for now, let's uh, hashtag always end with food. Yep, 19th whole content to wrap up the Course of Life podcast. We are at Always End With Food on Instagram, at Always End With Food if you want to check out our random food content there. And obviously, the highlight of this past week, Mike, was the July 4th hot dog eating contest. Sadly, though, Sans Joey Chestnut, the legend yep. band. It was, it, was, it was a sad sight not seeing him there last week. You know, he's more interested in making a buck than winning for the umpty umpth time this eating contest. <laughs> yeah, that Impossible Foods money was probably pretty good. And don't worry, he got a Pepsi endorsement a week after the ban. So I'm sure Joey Chestnut's pocketbook and bank account are doing just fine. But it opened the door for someone new, Mike. Patrick Bertoletti from Chicago, Illinois, ate his record 58 hot dogs and buns to get the W. Joey Chestnut did eat in an impressive way, Mike, he did a five-minute competition to get some troops at an Air, at Air Force Base in El Paso, and he ate 57 dogs and buns in five minutes. 57 and five, Mike, hinting at the idea that he could break 80 HDB maybe next year. That is, if he's allowed back in the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Competition. You know, I got to think that Nathan's, yeah, I, I don't know what ratings were like for them this year, but I got to think they weren't as good. Yeah, you got to wonder, so. right? I mean, there was definitely a little bit less buzz, but at the same time, what a lot of people did walk away saying is it actually made it a little bit more competitive because we didn't know who was going to mm -hmm. win, and there was a, a much smaller deficit between first and second and third, which made it a little bit more compelling. Shout out to Mickey Sudo, who won the women's competition. She downed 51 dogs 
Mike. Mm. She could compete against the boys next year and finish top yep. three, top four for sure. Uh, so maybe we see that next July 4th. Uh, I was not gorging, gorging myself in anything this weekend, <laughs> Alex. Um, like they were, but I, I did try something that I've never had before. Okay. I had a, I had gooseberries. You ever gooseberries. Had a gooseberry? and I've, I've seen this by name, but I don't think yep. I've ever had one either. So uh, I had a, I had yellow gooseberries. They were selling them at uh, Whole Foods and decided to get them and try them. Yep. I'll Google and, while everyone else does listening. Yep. Uh, they're little. They're like a, the size of a maybe a large grape or like a medium sized cherry tomato. Um, and these ones were were like a yellow orange, quite firm. And they tasted a little bit like an apple which was very odd. Wow. I'm looking at them right now. Nice consistency and and the yellow ones too. Interesting. Yeah. And what I'll say is that if you served me gooseberries, I would eat them, but I will not buy them again. Interesting. Would you have a gooseberry jam? Would you be interested in that? Uh, Potentially. Just the first thing I I saw on Google Images and wanted to get your opinion on it. The the texture of the gooseberry was was quite firm, so it was a maybe mildly off-putting. And the there are what I'm assuming is like seeds in the middle, which gave it a little textural difference. Got it. Um so it it was it was a little like I didn't know what I was expecting walking into it. I really had no idea. Um but I think I they were a little drying too. So they weren't as they weren't like juicy like a grape or a cherry tomato might be. Fascinating. All right, so, gooseberries. We're unpacking yeah. new foods here each week yes. on the Course of Life. Love that review. Always. All right, that's a wrap on Always End with Food and our Course of Life podcast episode. Thank you for tuning in this far. If you made it, be sure to like and subscribe where you're listening, and we'll see you next week.